Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. So welcome today to our podcast. I'm so thrilled to have with me today a very important person, especially in our Dallas area. Dale Petrosky is the president and CEO of our Dallas Regional Chamber. And this is one of the largest organizations in the country, the largest and 1,100 members. He has done incredible things with the chamber since he came in 2014. Let me welcome you, Dale. Thank you, Valerie. Gl glad to be here. I just, uh, gosh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, and we only have 30 minutes. <laughs> but one thing I know about you is that you love baseball. You play baseball. Yeah. You follow baseball. Mm -hmm. Do you watch it at work? No, I don't watch it at work. <laughs> Darren watches it at work. Darren watches it at work. <laughs> okay. Darren's got the, he's got a two-screen deal at his desk, and when the Cubs are on, and the Cubs play a lot of afternoon games, uh -huh. he's, got them, he's got them going. I, I will say the Rangers play uh, about every two weeks. They'll play a home afternoon game on a Wednesday or Thursday, and I'll have it on, but I don't sit there watching it. <laughs> but at night, when I go home, I watch every pitch. You I know? bet you I do. do. I do. I, but I, I have it on to get the score and see replays, uh, but I'm working. But, but when I do go home, I, that's all I do is watch <laughs> baseball. <laughs> well, Darren is the <laughs> Senior Vice President of Communications who's with us today. Darren, thank you for coming. Big Cubs fan. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's coming up soon. Yeah. But I, I mentioned that because... Um, you know the old saying, three strikes and you're out. You've had three wins, more than three wins, and you just keep going. I'm just um, amazed at three things about you to start with today, Dale. One is that you were the assistant White House press secretary to President Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Let's start with that. Okay. How did that happen? Crazy story. I was the chief of staff on Capitol Hill, and my boss, Congressman Goodling from York, Pennsylvania, used to have important people from Washington come up to his district for a dinner once a year. Mm -hmm. And this particular year, 1982, no, excuse me, uh, 1983, he invited Larry Speaks up. Larry Speaks was President Reagan's press secretary. Mm -hmm. And so I flew up with Larry, and it was just the two of us in the small little Air Force jet, four-person jet, and it was about an hour flight, and we were talking about Capitol Hill and talking about his job in the White House, and then all of a sudden we realized we both loved baseball, and, <laughs> that, and that was it. It was an instant connection. Went to the dinner. <clears throat> I made sure he got shown around. We had a great flight back. You know, we really bonded that night, and got home and wrote him a letter, and then he wrote me a letter, how great it was to spend time together. And then I didn't hear from him for a year and a half. And I go back to my office. One day I'm in my office working on Capitol Hill, and my assistant said, I've got Larry Speaks on the phone. And I thought, this oh. is interesting. And uh. so he said, hey, Dale, long time, no talk. Uh, I said, yeah, how are you doing? He, says, uh, he said, I'm doing well. He said, I, I know you're busy. I'm busy. He said, I'd just like to ask you a question. How would you like to come work for the president and me? Oh. And it was it was as simple as that, and uh, I got very flustered. I said, well, "I got to talk to my boss about this." And you and, were you were doing what at the time? I was the chief of staff for a congressman, okay. so I ran a congressional office for a congressman, and so um, so that was it. I, he had me down a couple of days later, and it, it was a, it was a surreal experience because it was mm. the first time I'd ever been to the White House. You know, I lived in Washington for three or four years by that point, but never been to the White House and got led into the northwest gate and um, walking up the driveway to the uh, west wing. And, and, uh, there's a, and when, the, when the president's in the west wing, there's a Marine guard at the door mm. dressed in you know the, the best dress blues <laughs> that you can be in. And I, I was a, just a kid that didn't know anything. And I went to reach for the door. And that Marine in his white gloves pulled oh. that door and saluted me. And, and let me in, and I thought, I could get used to this. <laughs> How old were you at the time, 29. Dale? No, no, I, I, at that point I was about 20, let me think about this. That was 
April of 85. I was 29. 29 Yeah, I was 29. Years old. Yeah, that was a life-changing moment, of course. And my, my life mm. never was the same after that. It was, a, it was a change of trajectory for me. First of all, getting to Washington from Michigan was a big change of trajectory, but never did I ever dream that that could happen. So I'm going to go back to that, but you just took us to your upbringing. I'd mm -hmm. love to hear how you go from Michigan wherever you were. I know where you were, but mm -hmm, I'd love mm -hmm. you to, to share the okay. story of humble beginnings. Yeah, so I grew up in a very working class town west of Detroit called Inkster. And Inkster was a very blue collar uh, community filled with a lot of good people. And I, I was one of nine kids, uh, went to a Catholic school growing up. and. Um, we lived in a 1,300 square foot house. Those nine, nine kids. Nine kids plus two parents, 11 people in a 1,300 square foot house. Dogs, cats, it, anything yeah, else? Yeah, we had one dog, yeah, <laughs> no cats. But, uh, but uh, did that for the first 15 years of my life. And uh, then my dad, who didn't have a college degree, but was a very smart guy and a very, very, very um, uh, personable and outgoing and wonderful guy, mm. um, just just made it. He 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 uh, he was in the furniture business and started up from the warehouse to sales director. Then they let him buy a piece of the store, and then he figured out when he was an owner, he started analyzing sales uh, where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. Realized that forty percent of the sales were coming from ten percent of the floor space, and that was mattresses and recliners. And so he decided to take a shot and open his own stores uh, about two hours north of Detroit, so he wouldn't compete with his former partners. And he, one store did well, then he built a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and in the end he had 10 stores. And so we moved from that little 1,300 square foot house, as I say, about five rungs up the ladder to Birmingham. Birmingham is one of the nicest mm -hmm. suburbs in Detroit. So yes. we went from a very, from one of the least nice suburbs of Detroit to the nicest suburb of Detroit in, in one move. Culture shift. As a culture shift, and it really, it's the greatest gift I've ever had because it allowed me to understand that that life in that in that working class area mm -hmm. and the life in the more upper middle class area. And what I realized, Valerie, is that people in the working class area, some of the greatest people I've ever known were mm -hmm. from that area. Mm -hmm. And some of the worst people I'd ever known were from that area. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to Birmingham, some of the greatest people I've ever known from that area <laughs> and some of the worst people I've ever known were from that area. So one doesn't matter to the other. It, you know, there's no correlation between you know, wealth or, or, or you know, income and, Title. and, and, um, and, and values and, and integrity. Mm. You know? Integrity. Yeah. You know, that, um, thank you for that story. That, that in itself, the word integrity, uh, knowing you, that's very important <clears throat> to you. And you said you learned that from your dad. Yeah, and my mom. I mean, really, I, I, it's interesting. I gave a, a little talk yesterday at a Texas Women's University event, and, uh, and I said that um, I was going through all the women in my life that were, you know, important to me, from my, my wife and my mother and my mother-in-law and my sisters and the women I work with at work and the great female leaders in the community that I work with and, and, and my grandmas. And I said about my mom, I said she was a combination of strong will and sweetness, mm. but the sweetness didn't come till later in life, <laughs> and that got a big, that got a big rise out of the audience. And my wife Anne was sitting right in the front row, and she, she, she's known my mom for forty six years, and she knew she, she was laughing and smiling and nodding her head yes. So, but my mom was it was always about what was right, mm. it wasn't what was easy, it was what was right, and we're going to do the right thing here. And uh, and my dad was very much that way too. They were. They were very much uh, from a little town in northern Michigan, and they were taught to do the right thing, and the right thing by people. <laughs> yeah, doing it right. Thank you for that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, when you moved from, from the small town to Birmingham, you were a junior, right? Yes. Uh -huh. 
And what was that like? How did you make that transition from over here to over yeah. here? It was an interesting transition because that particular summer, I was on a national championship baseball team. We, we, it was so exciting. We, we were a really good team. Two of those players actually went on to play in the major leagues. And, um, and we, we were fif I was 15 years old at that point. And I had just come back from College Park, Maryland, where we had won the championship. And I was on a high, of course. What did you play? <clears throat> second base. Uh -huh. I was a leadoff hitter, switch hitting uh, second baseman, leadoff hitter. And um, so came back, and we were moving that summer. And I was distraught that we were moving because I, at my old school, I was the starting second baseman as a sophomore on the varsity. And I was the second string quarterback on the varsity in football. And I was about to become the starting quarterback uh, the, my junior year. And we were moving. And, and you know, I was, you, when, you're, when you're that age, it's all about you. <laughs> so sure. I had no, you know, I wasn't thinking about we're going to move, we're going to take a big leap forward for our family and generations to come. It's like, what about me? I built a life here. We're not leaving this now, are we? Okay. So, so anyway, um, we came back and then we were moving and, and my mom uh, drove me to practice at my new school during preseason. You know, this is, we called it hell week because it was mor morning, <laughs> morning practice very tough practices, and then uh, afternoon practice, twice, two a days, to get ready for the season. And <clears throat> I went the first couple of days, after coming off this high, being on this national championship team, to these kids that I had no clue who they were. They mm -hmm. didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. The coaches didn't know who I was. I, I'm like, don't you know who I am, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, I was about number six on the depth chart for quarterback um, my, the first couple of days. And after the third day of practice, I was tired and whipped and not having any fun. These were not my friends. I didn't know who they were. And they didn't really appreciate me. And um, my mom came to pick me up at the end of a long day. Um, and I said, Mom, I'm not playing football anymore. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she didn't care that much about sports. She looked at me with these steely eyes. And she said, you are playing football. And and I, I was taken aback. I had felt a little shiver on my spine at that moment because she never talked to me like that too much. I kind of knew what she wanted just by the way she did things. But that was one. She really kind of zinged me on it. And, and I went back to practice the next day with a new resolve that mm. if I'm going to play this thing, I'm going to do it right. I'm not feeling sorry for myself anymore. And within two weeks, I became the starting quarterback at my new high school. I went from number Whoa. six to number one. And our first game was against our arch rival, Seaholm. Uh, we played it before school even started. We played it a couple days before the first day of classes. So all the kids in school were at the game, and they say, who is that quarterback? We don't even know who that is, he, you know, because I hadn't been to school yet. And I carried the ball in the first four plays of the game, so my name was being my being used over and over again. And um, so when school started a few days later, I was the new kid in school, but I was the new quarterback in school. And it, ma it made a huge difference in how I assimilated into my new school. And then shortly after that, met this beautiful young girl who, um, and I was meeting all kinds of people, but uh, who, um, Later that year, I began to date, and uh, we dated for six years. And now she's been my wife for forty years. So, so That's all that stuff, nice all that stuff happened within a couple of weeks. My whole life changed course, moving from Inkster to Birmingham. The challenge of the football part of it, mm -hmm. to becoming the starting quarterback, to meeting my wife, which has just been an amazing journey ever since. So life happens so beautifully when it's just meant to be. Yeah. So you. Moved then, graduated, went to Michigan State. Went to Central Michigan first okay. to play baseball, and uh, but I wasn't very good. You know, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I'm an okay player, but uh, you realize who can play and who can't. And I realized that I was not going to be a Division One starting uh, baseball player, even though that was my dream, a lot of guys' dreams. But I under, I was smart enough to understand that this isn't going to be my future. And so after two years of that, my, and Ann went to Western Michigan. Mm. I went to Central, she went to Western. And we saw each other just about every weekend. So 150 miles between the schools. Oh, that's love. Yeah. <laughs> and I hitchhiked. 
I hitchhiked no most weekends. Yep. Did you? <laughs> yeah, we still have the signs. I had uh, I had a big white poster board that I put fluorescent tape on, and there was only a couple roads that took you to Kalamazoo. It was down 27. So the, if you stood out on 27 in Mount Pleasant and went south, you were going to Lansing. It was 60 miles south. So my one first sign said Lansing. It never took me more than five minutes to get picked up. You know, they take me to Lansing. Then there was one, then you go from Lansing to Marshall on, on 27, so on, uh, on 69. And so my next sign said Marshall. And then I get on 94, and uh, my next sign said Kazoo, Kalamazoo, K-A-Z-O-O. -O. And it was three, three <laughs> roads, and I would get there like that, and then I would reverse it and go back the other way. So, yeah, and I, I, had, some, I had some pretty interesting rides. Now, it, just, just the passion you have in telling me that story, how did you get then to Washington? So, so let me get back. So, so then we decided after two years that this baseball thing wasn't going to work out, and Ann and I knew we wanted to be together, and so we said, let's just merge at Michigan State so, we're not, so we can be together all the time. And so, so I went to Michigan State, and Ann went to Michigan State, and it took us th three years at State because some of our classes did not transfer. So we went mm. five years to Michigan State. And um, so... So anyway, th this is the story about how I got to Washington. My last term at Michigan State, I only had three credits because I really only needed two of the three terms to, to graduate. But I was a re an RA, a resident assistant in the dorm. Oh, okay. I it, was too. How were? interesting. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. I, those are a lot of life lessons. Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was an RA, and all I cared about was being on the softball team because my, the year before, there are 500 teams on campus. We assembled this superstar team of softball players, and we lost the championship game by one run oh. the year before. So mm. we, we vowed come, we're going to come back next year. We're all staying together, and we're going to win it. So that was that was my whole goal my senior year was to win that, that campus-wide championship. So we so that so all I did my my. Um, all I had to do my last term, that spring term, was take one class, sociology class, pass or fail, and <laughs> win a softball championship, and that was it. But but I'd already we already knew we were getting married in October, so this is like you know March, April, May, and so I thought you know I probably better start looking for a job. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I mean, and I think my father-in-law was wondering. What the, is this guy going to do? This guy doesn't look like he's going to any place here. So I, went, I took the bus down Michigan Avenue from, Lance, from East Lansing, which is where Michigan State is, to Lansing, which is the state capital. Mm -hmm. I walk into the United Press International room uh, at the state capitol building, and there are two um, people in there that look like Mama Cass and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, like Bob Dylan. And they got long, stringy hair. This is 1978. They got long, stringy hair. They're smoking cigarettes. They're pounding on typewriters. They just look like they couldn't, they're not having any fun. But they're the bureau. That's the chief, bureau. Uh, and assistant chief. And I walk in. I'm this bright, fresh faced kid. And, and I said, Hey, uh, hi, I'm Dale Petrosky. I'm a student at Michigan State. I'd love to have an internship. And they're like banging away. They look at me like, <laughs> whatever. They kept and they kept typing, and so I just sat down and I just they couldn't care less if I was there. I just kept coming back every day, and and waiting for them to give me an assignment. I was an eager, I was like a Boy Scout, you know. And about two weeks in, they were they were covering the budget, the state budget, big story for the UPI, right? And they're banging it away, and I said, I, I tapped them on the shoulder and I said, Hey, uh, can I cover that my motorcycle rally out in front of? The, Capitol building, because there was a motorcycle rally of people, it's called Let Those Who Ride Decide. These are people who didn't want to wear helmets if they didn't, oh, okay. weren't made to, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just let me ride. Yeah, just let me ride. And so there was a big debate about whether we should let people ride without helmets or not. Sure. So they had staged this big rally. And so I, so I said, can I cover that? And they said, whatever. <laughs> they could care less. And oh. so, I, so I went out and covered the story. And my story actually appeared on the front page of the Detroit News, and theirs was buried like an A14. Because it was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting. And so th then they started paying attention to me a little bit. And a couple weeks later, uh, they gave me an assignment, and it, it made it onto the front page of the Detroit Free Press. And so, so then 
and you know, the term is coming to an end. It's like June 1st, and I'm graduating June 10th. Ann and I are both graduating June 10th. And <clears throat> this, the, there were four press secretaries uh, in the Capitol building, one for each caucus, Senate Democratic press secretary, who took care of all the members, Senate Democrats, mm -hmm. Senate Republicans, House Republicans, House Democrats. Mm -hmm. So the House Republican press secretary sees me in the hall, and he says, Psst, Dale, come here. So I went over to see him. He said, what are you doing after graduation? I said, need a job. He didn't know you? Oh, he knew me. He okay. knew me just from, you know, I interviewed him about things oh, when okay. I was doing stories. And, and, and he said, what are you doing after you graduate? And I said, need a job. I'm getting married, man. He said, uh, why don't you come work for me? I said, he said, I got an opening coming up. One of my people's leaving. So that's how I got my first job. It was totally, I mean, again, I'm totally oblivious to, I need a job. It's coming to the end. He just kind of taps me on the shoulder and says, come with me. And that was my first job. So I did that for about <clears throat> a year. All right, so let me back up. So Anne graduates. She gets a job with the transportation department as a planner in, um, in downtown Lansing. My job's in the Capitol building. They're right next door to each other. She starts her job at 9 o'clock. I start my job at, no, she starts her job at 7.30. I start my job at 9 o'clock. That's mm -hmm. those are the hours. But I thought, I'm not going to lay in bed till 9 o'clock if she's got to start at 7. So I get up with her, and we have breakfast, and I walk her down six blocks to work, and I go to my office. So I get my office at 7.30. Believe me, I'm the only one in the Capitol at 7.30. Nobody's there before 9 o'clock. And so about a year in, I'm in my office, and a young state representative from right down the hall comes and knocks on my door and says, hey, Dale, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He said, uh, you're a hardworking guy. You're always here early. Oh. <laughs> this is a lesson here. Uh, there is There's a, a lesson. There's a lesson here. And he said, um, I want to talk to you about something. He said, um, this, is, this is 1979. He said, I think Ronald Reagan's going to run for president. And I think that he might win the nomination. He just might win the nomination. And if he wins the Republican nomination, he might have a chance to beat President Carter in 1980. And if he does, then my congressman, he says, David Stockman, I'm sure will be taken as part of his cabinet because he's working closely with Reagan. And if that happens, I want to run for Congress in that open seat. Will you run my campaign? <laughs> like, First of all, all these dominoes have to fall. Chances of that are like not nil, right? And secondly, I've never run anything in my life. I'm oh 24 my. years old, Gosh. you know? And I, but I say, sure, of course. Because I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, 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 I'm thinking, of course. I mean, what's, why, why am I going to say no? This isn't going to happen anyway. And so, sure enough, it all happens. And uh, he comes to me and says, hey, you ready to go? I said, yeah, let's go. So I uh, went down to his district on February 14th. The election was March 21st. We had five weeks. It was a sprint, not, wow. a, mar not a marathon. We had to get it done. We had to identify our voters, and we had to organize quickly. And I think uh, I mentioned this to you before. Um, the favorite in the race was David Stockman's hand-picked campaign manager, Harvard-educated lawyer, one of the richest men in the district. Everybody knew he was going to win. And, and the news that came out every day was about Globensky, Globensky, Globensky. He's raised this amount of money, and he's way ahead in the polls and so forth. And we just, we, we had a staff of three, and uh, I was the leader. I, I made everybody wear a coat and tie every day, even though we never saw anybody. But that was just, we just wanted to feel professional. We were just young kids. And... Um, and we identified our voters, we hustled, we worked from 6 in the morning till midnight every day, that was the rule, and we won by 800 votes. Oh. One of the biggest upsets in Michigan history, and that's how I got to Washington. So I, got, I get to Washington in April of 1981, when President Reagan is just starting his first term. It, it was the, and actually, it was just after the assassination attempt, which was on March 31st of, of that year. So we get there just after, as the president's recovering, but, but there's great new excitement in Washington about what's, what the future holds with Ronald Reagan in the White House versus Jimmy Carter in the White House. So that's how we got introduced to Washington. That, you know, these stories you can't make up, Dale. <laughs> it's amazing. It is amazing. How did it feel for you to take part in his trip to uh, Gorbachev and all of that? Well, 
you know, we knew this is an interesting period of time because President Reagan, in his entire first term, was very um, strongly anti-Soviet uh, because he was trying to establish that the United States, we needed some le some bargaining leverage mm -hmm. on the Soviets. He he knew he wanted to bring the Soviet Union to its knees. Mm -hmm. But there was an arms buildup where we were building and they were building, and, and it was a Cold War. Mm -hmm. And it had been going on since World War II, the end of World War II. And President Reagan and his really smart people around him knew that the Soviets only had so much money to keep building up. They needed to feed their people and build up. We don't need to feed our people. Our people feed themselves. So we, so, so we could build up, and at some point, they couldn't build up anymore, and they would cry uncle. And at that point, and, 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 but what was interesting about it, three Soviet leaders died in President Reagan's first term. We had Brezhnev, mm -hmm. and Dropoff, and Chernyenko. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were only in, uh, Brezhnev was a longtime leader who died fairly early in President Reagan's first term. And then Andropov was a, uh, lasted maybe a year and died of a heart attack. And then Ch uh, Chernyenko, I don't know the order of Andropov and Chernyenko, to be honest with you, but, but they were dying uh, quickly. And then a 52-year-old, which is like a kid in Soviet terms, yes. guy named Mikhail Gorbachev, comes out of nowhere and becomes the new leader. And that's when, the, frankly, Mrs. Reagan whispered to the president, now might be the time. Interesting. Now might be the time to have it, to make an overture to Gorbachev, because he seems like a different kind of leader, a new kind of leader, open to the West. Yes. Um, and he's in trouble. They're in trouble, because they just can't keep building up. And we've, we, we've got them. And, and so uh, that started the um, first meetings of President Reagan and Gorbachev. First, and you were there. I was there for the first two. The first one was in <clears throat> um, November of 1985 in, uh, Re in Reykjavik, Iceland. No, excuse me, in Geneva, Switzerland. The first one was in Geneva. And then the second was in Reykjavik, Iceland in October of 86. And that was the beginning of the end of communism, beginning mm. of the end of the Soviet Union. And we, to be honest with you, we, we knew it was a big deal. We did not know it was the beginning of the end. We just thought that these were, in hindsight, it's easy to see it now. But at the time, we just knew this is a big deal. This is the start of something that could lead to a more peaceful world. Uh, and, uh, but it was a, those were really um, watershed moments in American history. Yeah. Dale, did yeah. you write those famous words? <laughs> no, no, no. There's a great story about that. I actually, by the time the president gave his Berlin Wall speech in 1987, I had moved on. I was no longer in the White House. But, but it's a, there's a great story about it because the president, you know, there was always this notion that the president would just read what his staff wrote for him. He was a great actor and he could just, you Ad know, lip. sell, right? Mm -hmm. um, not true. He, he had very very strongly held beliefs on a number of issues, anti-communism, abortion, um, the role of government in your life, national security, police security, things like that. They're, those are things he really cared about. And they were getting ready. I was already out of the White House. I was actually at this point at um, transportation. I was assistant secretary of transportation for public affairs under Elizabeth Dole at this point. Mm -hmm. But they were going over to Berlin and uh, the president was about to deliver a speech at the Berlin Wall. And uh, they were preparing for the trip, and so he brought his speechwriters in and told them what he wanted to say, and they went back and drafted the speech. And it went through about 20 people. I was on, when I was in the White House, I was on that list of those 20 that got to see every speech, the drafts, mm -hmm. and we'd mark them up and question this or question that or add a word here, and, it, and then it would go back and it would get to the president in final draft form, and he'd look at it. And the first draft he got on the Berlin Wall speech, he wrote in the, in the uh, margin, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. And he sent it back to the speechwriters. He wanted to be tougher than the speechwriters wanted to be. Mm -hmm. and, and the second draft 
went through again. It goes through the National Security Council and the Defense Department and the and the the uh, State Department, and they took it out. They said you can't say that; it's too belligerent. That'll start World War III. And so it gets back to him, the second draft, and he writes in. He says, "What don't they understand? I'm saying this, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall." So then he sent, they sent it back in. Now he's on Air Force One on his way to Berlin, and the final draft gets brought to him on Air Force One. And he, he, he looks at it, and it's taken out again. And, and they said, Mr. President, you can't say that. He said, I'm saying it. <laughs> what don't you understand? I'm saying it. And uh, it became, of course, he said it, and mm -hmm. it, it became the, uh, the, greatest, um, the greatest phrase of his presidency and his, of his life. Mm -hmm. And it was all his, and uh, against the advice of those who thought they knew better. There's a lesson there, isn't yep. there? Trust yourself. Yep. Trust yourself. You have so many what I call teachable points of view, which I'll capture all together at some point, but that's really a good one. And, and then when, when President Reagan passed, I loved the story you shared with me before the show about going to see Nancy Reagan. Yeah. Um, actually, um, I saw Mrs. Reagan after the president passed away. Mm -hmm. And so, now, now, are you talking about when I went to L.A. and the president was still alive, or, or did, was, was it uh, when I saw Mrs. Reagan alone? Alone. Okay. So you thought it was going to be quick. So, so in 2008, early 2008, I was going to be in Los Angeles. I was president of the Baseball Hall of Fame at that point, and I was going to be in L.A. And um, I called my good friend Fred Ryan, who, who is very close to Mrs. Reagan, and he's the chairman of the Reagan Library, and, uh, and is just, just her, he, she leans on him more than anybody else. And I said, Fred, I'd like to go see Mrs. Reagan, just to pay a visit on her for, sure. for 10 minutes. Just, I just want to say hello to her. Uh, and so he arranged for it, and so I showed up. And I thought I'd give her a hug and ask her how she was doing. She had just fallen. She, she had just gotten mm -hmm. out of the hospital. Um, and she was pretty feeble at that point. So I get there, and she is waiting for me with uh, tea and cookies. Uh, and uh, she takes me around, and she showed me all around the house and you know, the view from the backyard of Los Angeles from, from their home. They were up in Bel Air. And, uh, and then she showed me all the things on the walls that meant something to her. And, and she said, let's go, have, let's go have a visit. And it was a two-hour visit. Oh, and it dear. was just her and me and just talking about all the old folks of the administration and what they're doing now and little, some of her views on some of the people and because uh, she, she had views on people. And uh, and she had she she really had views on President Obama. She liked President Obama very much. Uh, thought he was a really good man and uh, and, and a good leader for this country. Um, and so you know it was just a great moment of uh, two hours with her. And that and that was the last time I saw her alive. And and then I, of course I got invited to her funeral, and um, that was special too. She's great. Dale, we've just begun. <laughs> You, you mentioned, uh, I want to close this segment out, and I want to ask you to come back. Would you do that? Sure, of course. Because we haven't begun. We haven't talked about all the things that you've done in, in our city and bringing so many corporate, how many at this point corporate headquarters? 126 in the last eight years. There's so much to share. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you for taking the time today. And... Uh, all of the things about my lands, the, the, what you're doing now, president of the Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame, you were with the Rangers for a while. I mean, your accolades go on and on. So I'm going to kind of tease the audience and say just stay tuned because we're going to have you back. And I can I shake your hand and oh, say thank you, Valerie. a busy day, it's and I know fun. you got two hours sleep. <laughs> so, wow. Well, thank you. All you, right. You're very we're, kind. We're going I, I, lo I love talking with you. Thank this you. This is so great. This is so great. Just chatting, right? So we will have Dale back. We'll learn so much more about his incredible background. And in the meantime, 
you just stay authentic and think about all the teachable points of view and the things that he learned so far that he shared about his career path. So until then, see you next time. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.